Spirit Science, Episode 1, Thoughts. You know, it dawned on me as I started to film this that maybe I should drink spirits while I'm watching this. I mean, it is called Spirit Science, so maybe it kind of works. Except for the fact that this is just some leftover crown. When I buy spirits, I eat whiskey, vodka, etc., I like to buy the good stuff. I'm not wasting good liquor on this shit. So, with that said, I've got my Muskoka Brewery Mad Tom IPA. Very good beer, by the way. If you can find it, track it down. Get some. <sighs> so, here we go. The religion of the future will be a cosmic religion. It should transcend personal God and avoid dogma and theology. When did Einstein say that? Seriously, I found a bunch of stuff about him talking about how there's a cosmic religi religiosity or something like that, but no place where he said that specific quote. So since he has all these quotes that seem to fit with what you're saying, why pick one that you cannot show where he said it? Can you feel it? A sort of anticipation growing stronger and stronger? No. No, I can't. Another way of putting it is time is speeding up. Uh, yeah, that, that's called relativity. The faster you move, the slower time goes. Or, you know, if so, vice versa, if you move slower, time goes a little bit faster. But I somehow think that's not what you're talking about. I've heard that discussion for a while now. I know most people have felt it at some point, maybe while watching the news or perhaps something in their own lives. Something big is about to happen. Actually, my thought when he said that was that, uh, you know, watch pot never boils. Things along that line. Or, you know, just the more you anticipate something, the slower it takes, the longer time goes because you're more anxious, when in fact time is pretty constant. You can see signs of it all over the world. Revolutions rapidly spreading across the Middle East, protests occurring in America and Europe, earthquakes are devastating the world, like in J Japan, Myanmar, and Greece. And guess what? This stuff has been happening since the beginning of time. We just happen to have this advanced communication infrastructure now that allows us to actually know about things happening or pretty much in real time, as opposed to there being this long delay before finding out about it, as there was, heck, even 100, 150 years ago. The global economy is failing so hard that it looks like we're looking forward into a global recession, the likes of which makes the 30s look like a cakewalk. I'd like some of my subscribers who are more versed in economics to actually comment on that part because I don't see it. Not to mention that if global warming doesn't put our planet into an ice age, we're going to kill ourselves from overpopulation for sure. <sighs> Alarm is thinking much. And using the rate of doubling, we definitely don't have the resources to survive the way we are for maybe little over 10 years. I call into question that 10 years remark. That doesn't seem to be realistic. Uh, the estimates I've heard have been somewhere around 50 years. Now granted, we do have a problem with the population explosion, however, not to that extent. Yet, despite all of these things, we're about to learn something amazing. I highly doubt that. It's something that will transform the Earth into something completely different, something incredible and beautiful. Many people across the globe have learned about this, and they've applied it to themselves and witnessed marvelous changes. Others have dedicated their lives to talking about it, to teaching it. <sighs> oh, we are going to get into such woo right now. I can just feel it. I'm going to need to open this beer very, very soon. I'm someone who's still exploring it, and I want more people to talk about it with. Mind, body, spirit. This is the sacred trinity that allows us life on Earth. Okay, um, mind and body, same thing. Sorry, they're the same thing. Your mind, i.e. your brain, is part of your body. And, uh, one is interdependent on the other. You kill the body, you kill the brain. You kill the mind. Spirit? I'm sorry, you, there's nothing demonstrating that a spirit exists. I know some of my religious watchers will object to that, but... I'll, I'll, tell me what a spirit is. Go ahead. What is a spirit? How do you measure it? 
Come on. Tell me. Oh, wait. I bet you this video is going to say that it shows that a spirit exists. It, it doesn't. It doesn't, i.e. the video doesn't show that a spirit exists. <sighs> this is going to be really painful. Without even one of these three, we could not function properly. Yet, in today's world, we only really truly understand two of the three. Again! Those two? Same thing! We have scientifically mapped the mind and the body. We understand ev next to every aspect about each of them. Yet, what do we really know about the spirit, the soul? Why are you even saying that one exists? Seriously! What is it? Where does it come from? For centuries, religions have been the primary source for answers pertaining to the soul. But they're not concrete. Many different religions have a different answer and ideas about how things work on this level. Really? Different religions have different ideas? Wow! What a shocker! Recently, however, a discovery was made, which led to new discoveries and further discoveries. You're not going to say exactly what those discoveries are right now? You're just going to be really vague and say, a discovery led to another discovery, which led to another discovery, which led to some kind of insight. You suck as a storyteller. These incredible insights went largely unnoticed by the global community, and while governments and secret services of the world acknowledge them, it wasn't something that really got to the masses. <laughs> Government... Governments and secret agencies. Secret services, sorry. But... Oh, here. Here. Oh, why is it this opening? This bottle opener sucks. Today, this information is still slowly coming out, and I'm going to share it with you. Oh goody, he's going to share it with us. In the world of science, what do we really know about thoughts? We know we can measure them by hooking up scanners. You can measure the frequency that are emitted when you think them. They're measurable, yet there isn't anywhere specific in the brain that holds them. Whoa, 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 whoa. They are measurable. There isn't any specific place in the brain that holds them. Um, uh, yes. Yes, there is. You even showed a map of what map of different locations in the brain and I poured that a little too quickly yes when you actually think of different things different areas of your brain light up that is where those thoughts originate is this really such a hard concept for you to grasp is it possible that you create your thoughts outside your mind mm, maybe not but is it possible that you create your thoughts into the external world from your mind? Um, well, considering your body is part of the world, yes, when you think something, you can then act on that thought to make it happen. What? This is what we're going to talk about today. Have you ever had a moment where you knew exactly what someone else was going to say about two or three seconds before they even started talking? Y yes, because, you know, we actually pick up on subtle signs from other people about how they're reacting to certain things. Oh, and, uh, yeah, if you know the person for a while, you can kind of, you've heard them say certain things time and time again, so you know where their thought process is going. Uh, there's a term for that. What do you call that? Uh, it's empathy. Yeah, I, I think that's the term. Now, empathy can exist in multiple forms. There's the general, oh, somebody just stubbed their toe. I know what that feels like. But there's also the, yes, we've had this conversation before. I know exactly what you're going to say kind of empathy. There's no big mystery here. It's just we know how other people think because, you know, people in our, the closer you are to somebody, the more you tend to think like them, or at least from experience, know how they think. What, what, what's the big mystery here? Do you have a shared connection between a loved one or a pet where you can always tell exactly how the other is feeling or, or what they're thinking of, even if they're not really around? 
Even if they're not even around. Uh, what are you saying? I could be listening to the radio and hear a piece of news and know how my partner... I don't have one right at the moment. I'm just using that in the general kind of sense. Will feel about hearing that particular piece of news. Again, empathy. Have you ever met someone that you really got bad vibes from and your intuition turned out right? Um, I've also met people whom I thought were kind of creepy at the beginning, but then turns out that, no, my impression was completely wrong. So wh what's your point? We've all had experiences like these at least a few times, some many more than others. There are even a few people who can kind of tap into this experience quite easily. I believe one of the terms for it is psychic. <laughs> Let's say for the sake of discussion that when you think of something, anything, it appears right in front of you. No, not physically, but let's say it appears in a different realm that's in and around all of us. We'll just assume for now that it's not something that we're consciously aware of, and it's something that we're going to discuss later on. No, I'm not going to assume anything. You demonstrate it, or else I'm going to assume you're just pulling this out of your ass. That's what I'm going to assume. For now, let's just call it the Thought Realm. The Thought Realm. Uh, hmm. I'm envisioning putting you someplace very, very painful, and it's in my thought realm. Do you suppose this will actually happen? When you're doing something, you start by thinking about it. Whether you're building a pool in your backyard or making a sandwich, you have to have thought of it first. Even the subconscious thoughts for things like walking and breathing. Breathing is not a subconscious thought. It is actually just an automated part of your physiology. Same as your heart beating. I don't have to think to make my heart beat. It just happens. Just biological functioning. No thought required. This shouldn't be anything new to us. We think of things before we do them, even if it's a split second before them. This is just how we function, and our physical actions match the thoughts that we've created. You might say that you move through your thoughts, turning non-physical ideas into physical actions. Uh, alcohol! I thought I needed alcohol. I drank alcohol. It turns out I did need alcohol. When an inventor gets an idea, this idea can quickly spread throughout all of his colleagues and friends. Ideas and thoughts are spreadable. Multiple people can hold on to the same idea at once, allowing them to grow and develop further. It, it, it's this little device we have called communication that we use to, you know, spread thoughts. Either I say a thought and someone picks it up, I write it down, and then someone looks at it and... Actually, you know what? They're not even the same thought. They are very similar thoughts. But a thought only occurs up here. It's unique to me. I can spread similar thoughts, but no one is going to have the exact same thought. At least not in the, you know... Uh, hard, it's hard to explain. It's uh, like, my thought is my own. Even if you are thinking about the same thing, it's not the same thought. Just like if I copy data from a disk and give you a disk, that's two different copies of the same idea. They're not actually the same thing. In this scenario, don't think of thoughts as separate, but as a whole that everyone is latching onto. Again, this is based on the assumption that there is this thought realm that you haven't demonstrated actually exist. Of course, because we can't physically see this realm of thoughts, we can't tell exactly what the original idea was, only the interpretation that they describe using functions like speech and body language, as well as our own intuition, which is how thoughts connect to each other. Ugh, no. Intu that is not what intuition is. Intuition is seeing a scenario and then just kind of, oh, that's caused by this because I, you know, usually it's based on experience where you've seen something a million times before and you just leap to the conclusion without actually going through the entire process, you just know what the problem is. That's intuition. I have no idea what this intuition thing you're talking about is, but it doesn't sound anything like my definition of intuition. Because of this, we add a bit of our own creation to the mix, our own spice, while still working towards the same common goal. A social gathering is another good example of this at work too. 
people gathering together because they share the same ideas, thoughts, and emotions as the rest of the people there. An example could be a college course on architecture. People interested in architecture would attend the course because they share the same interests mentally. This shouldn't be anything mind-blowing. It's, it's our day-to-day -day lives, just from a different perspective. How exactly is that from a different perspective? All you've done is thrown on this thought realm bullshit, which doesn't explain anything. Jeez, just saying that, yes, these people have similar interests, therefore they're going to, you know, tend to group together. So bloody well what? I... Even if you're using something that someone else made, you're still creating this experience for yourself. You manifested that iPad or house or whatever into your experiences. So with thoughts connecting with other thoughts comes our first big realization. This new understanding of how intertwined we truly are, we are not only connected in the physical realm, but in a mental and spiritual way as well. How? You've just assumed there's this, this thought realm that, every, that connects everything and then made up a bunch of bullshit to fit into that thought realm. You haven't demonstrated anything. In fact, you yourself said, this shouldn't be any surprise that people who think similarly group together. Guess what? It's not. You haven't said anything new. In fact, you've added, just added this layer of bullshit that's not even necessary. Up until recently, humankind has always understood simply that they were connected only through their physical being. We assume that the conscious experience, as well as all of the thinking, was totally 100% isolated from the rest of everyone else. The fact is, we're not. We are so connected with each other, it's almost impossible to believe. Imagine that. Stuff I do affects other people. <gasps> what a shocker! A communal, in a communal species, things one person does affects multiple people. Wow! I'm shocked! Wait, no I'm not. Think about almost every creature on Earth. What do we really know about the bond that connects them? Geese are able to travel long distances, switching who flies in front like clockwork. Many fish swim in large schools, and we know that they don't have a form of verbal communication. Of course fish don't have a verbal form of communication. They can actually, you know, sight is another form of communication. Why, did, why are you kind of implying that everything needs to be verbal? That's bullshit. In fact, you know, visual communication came a long time before oral communication even became possible. Our pets are able to communicate with each other w without speaking, yet it's like they know what each other are feeling and connect in a very amazing personal way. Empathy? Do I really have to keep repeating myself here? Almost every observable creature on Earth has this connection with at least their own species, if not others. We as humans are the next step in life. We are not a next step in life. We are part of life. There is no step in life. Ugh, oh, you're sounding exactly like a creationist who says there's some kind of ladder of life. No. Everything that exists right now is equally evolved. We are equally evolved to birds. We are evolved to perform different things based on our environment, based on what yeah, based on the environment that we live in. Birds generally fly, sometimes they swim, sometimes they just run really fast and can, you know, kick really hard. But, because we followed a different, different evolutionary branch, we are all at the tips of those branches. There is no step here. But that doesn't mean we don't have this connection. What's to say we're not also connected to each other in this way? We've been out of touch with ourselves for an incredibly long time now. You know, I would just like to point out that, yeah, guess what? We are not the only species that can exhibit empathy. We are not the only species capable of communication. We just happen to have a different kind of communication than most other species have. We are not the only species that communicates orally. We are, appear to be the only species, at least, that forms complex sentences, but that's just because of how we evolved. Oh, more beer, more beer, more beer. And we are growing increasingly disharmonic. Actually, on that, I don't think we are growing increasingly more disharmonic. News coverage does focus a lot on the bad, but 
generally speaking, we are a lot more peaceful now than we have been pretty much any other time of our history. Now, you can always point to, oh, look at the conflicts going on in the Middle East, look at what's going on in Egypt, look at what's going on in Syria, look at the riots that are happening in such and such a place. Yeah, but compared to, say, the First World War, Second World War, going back even further to the Crusades, etc., we've been extremely violent throughout our entire history. Now, there are a lot more of us now, and we, again, we have this advanced communication infrastructure that allows us to spread information and get it virtually instantaneously from anywhere in the world. However, as a general rule of thumb, we are not anywhere near as violent as we were in the past. For the most part, most people go about their daily lives without really experiencing directly any kind of violence, which uh, even from a few hundred years ago wasn't really the case. Now, thoughts being created are just the tip of the iceberg. The real interesting part comes when you look at emotions. Emotions are much more powerful than thoughts. Emotions pull on you, they control your actions, they guide you throughout your life. It's not your thoughts that control where you sit in a class or on a bus, but it's if you like that girl or you think that guy smells. When a couple is together, it's their emotions that keep them tethered. Same with if they're fighting, it's their emotions that break them apart. You watch TV shows that you enjoy. You hang out with friends because you have emotional bonds with them. Oh, good God. This is starting to, this is starting to sound like something right out of that book. Oh, what's it called? That's the, the Secret. Uh, in fact, I know for a fact, since I've watched this already before, that that book comes up a little later on. <sighs> yeah. I don't really have much to say on this. It just really hurts hearing him talk. Now, this applies on a smaller scale, too. Do you ever have a morning where you wake up grumpy and stub your toe and think, oh, this is just going to be one of those days, and find that the entire day afterwards just goes terrible? And, and just everything goes wrong? What about the days when you wake up excited and happy and ready to go? Your whole day is just excellent in all of the right ways. Even if something bad does happen, you're less affected by it because you're in such a good place emotionally. Yes, you wake up grumpy, and every little thing that makes you a little bit more grumpy makes you more grumpy and you notice it more. Similarly, you wake up happy, and every little thing that makes you a little bit more happy, you notice it more. It's called selection bias. Seriously, it, it's just... It's a known phenomenon in science, and you have to control for it. Apparently, you're not. It's like the saying, I always hit red lights on my way into work. When, when you actually sit down and track the number of red lights you hit, it's actually not every light you hit that's red. You just happen to notice the ones that are red because you're looking out for them. When in fact, it's really about 50-50, if not, you know, you hit more green lights, but you happen to notice the red ones because they frustrate you more. Yeah. Oh, boy, oh, boy. You call, your, you call this science, and yet it has nothing to do with science. The reason these differences in how your day goes is because of your emotional state. People like to think the world will go on exactly the same without you, but it really won't. People interact differently with other people, and everyone would have a completely different experience if you were not there. I do have to kind of agree with that part. It doesn't explain shit, but whatever. Imagine this scenario. There's a bully in a playground who's looking for someone to beat on. There's kids playing sports, kids skipping rope, kids on the swings, and then off to the side there's one boy sitting in the grass watching the rest of everyone play. He doesn't feel like anyone else will want to play with him, so he sits apart from the group. The bully instantly knows where to go, and the circle of hurting begins. Actually, in my experience, that's not really how bullying works. Okay, this is personal experience. However, bullies will not necessarily pick on the person who's just sitting off alone. In fact, they'll probably leave that person alone. Generally, in my experience, a bully wants to be noticed. Picking on a person who's off to the side isn't going to get them noticed. A bully will s zero in on someone who just happens to look a little bit different. Not much. Maybe not even different. Just, they'll have something like the geek. 
the geek will hang out with geeks and they'll be a lot and they'll be off doing their thing by them you know in their group and then the bully will come along and bully who he just random person in that group a bully is looking for attention it doesn't necessarily need to be good attention well it's obviously not going to be good attention it's bad attention but they want that attention. If you go after the person who's alone, they're not going to get the attention. Again, that's my experience. Maybe someone else's will be different, but I have a bit of a problem with the bully going after the loner crowd. The, the bullies will tend to leave the loner crowd alone because, well, they're not going to get as much attention when they go after the loner. See, it's through the feeling of being vulnerable that you become vulnerable in the physical. If the boy had walked outside for recess and told himself, I can fit in, he would probably be playing sports right now. Have you ever taken a psychology course? I highly doubt that. I mean, I am a complete layman when it comes to psychology, but my bullshit detector is going off like wild when you say that. Oh boy. This applies to the bully as well. He didn't have anyone else to play with, probably because of some insecurity, mental, that led him to need th to hurt others. He thinks he's doing good for himself by hurting the boy, except he's really just hurting himself long term. I know some of you have psychology degrees. Is anything this guy's saying matching up with reality? To me, it, 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 it's really not. You can look into society and see a vast amount of evidence to support it, too. The people who are most successful are those who talk most of success. Those who speak most of illness have it. Yes, illness is also a creation of yours. Bullshit! Bullshit! Bullshit, 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 bullshit! Tell that to anyone! Anyone who has ever had cancer! Granted. When you're feeling depressed, it does leave you, it can suppress your immune system a little bit and leave you more susceptible to illnesses. But that is not the fucking general rule. You are lying. If you have a low immune system, it's because of you. Typically, we like to blame things on the virus going around or our own immune systems, but the way that we become susceptible to them is from inside, whether that there's some ongoing negative energy or some bad feeling that we allow into ourselves. We can heal ourselves also, but I'm going to save healing for another video. I have only one thing to say to you, and it's not really I'm going to say it, I'm going to show you. Right there, buddy. Right there. You are the kind of anti-medicine quack that I absolutely loathe. There's only one thing that becomes apparent from this understanding. You create your own reality. We are 100% responsible for the situations that we find ourselves in. The things that happen to us, good and bad. Bullshit! 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 Throughout history, we've always played the blame game. It's, it's his fault I didn't get the promotion. It's her fault I couldn't go to the game. It's everyone else's fault. I'm so depressed. Whatever it is, and this may be the hardest thing to truly get, it's your fault. Your happiness, your sadness, your fears, and your fortunes. Every single experience of your life on Earth was because of you. Yes. So everybody growing up in Africa, it's their fault that they live in abject poverty. Yeah. Sure. You know what? I know what's coming, so I'm just going to let this play out a little bit more. Remember, just as you are creating your own individual reality, we are all co-creating our realities as a collective. We are one species, and as a species, we are creating the realities that we are experiencing together. One common argument I hear is, what about starving kids in Africa? How are they creating their starving reality? I would respond to that that the Western way of life is not really allowing for everyone on the planet to live in the same abundance that the Westerners are, is it? And you're just debunked your own argument for me! Thank you very much, dude! Thank you! It's not... It's not... Oh, come on. 
You just admitted that everything that happens to you is not just your fault. Right there, in your own video. Bravo! Bravo! If our lifestyle isn't allowing other people to live how they want, then by definition, every, those people are not fully responsible for everything that happens to them, and ergo, by the same logic, you cannot say that everything that happens to an individual is entirely their fault. You just admitted as much. Right there. Thank you. I need a drink for that. We're using up all of the world's resources, hardly sharing anything unless they're paying a lot for it or if we're getting something out of it. And we ask why they're poor? We haven't been sharing with our brothers and sisters around the planet. But again, that's us as a collective creating the reality that we experience around the planet. <laughs> oh. Okay, come on. You keep switching between the individual and the collective. Is it the individual's responsibility? As in everything that happens to you is your own fault? Or is it the collective's? Make up your bloody damn mind. This applies through all levels. As a family, you create your reality, and your actions will change what the family experiences. Again, you just admitted that not everything that happens to us is our own fault. Fuck you. Because of this, and because we are not in tune with ourselves, it may often seem that sometimes we don't have complete control over what it is we experience. Sometimes we're seemingly forced into scenarios that seem out of our control. This happens as a result of our disharmony, and also lack of connection to our own intuition. When we become more in tune with ourselves, we can feel out certain scenarios and decide if that's a path we want to take. Maybe I won't go down into the dark alley. Maybe it feels right to not take that job. Blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to keep saying bullshit that comes to mind, and, you know, maybe it'll make sense to someone who's watching it. Beyond that, once you have the experience that you feel is out of your control, now it's your turn to decide what you do next. I have to pause it there, because this part that's coming up is fucking hilarious. You can allow the experience to get the best of you and drain your energy, and move into a dense, unhappy place emotionally. Or, you can decide to take it for what it is, an experience, and keep moving forward. Every dark cloud has a silver lining, and if you're looking for that silver lining, you'll have a much easier time finding it. <laughs> I love that show that again. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. You get into a car crash and you immediately start making out with the other person who was in the other car. Yeah. That happens all the time. Oh, crap. <laughs> oh, it, it was... Almost worth watching the video for that one scene. Almost. Many of us have heard of this thing called the Law of Attraction. The secret! The secret! I told you he mentioned the secret! Which talks about something similar to this, but talks more about evidence and not much about this thought realm. There's a good reason nobody talks about this thought realm. It's because you pulled it out of your damn ass. You haven't actually demonstrated that it exists. You said, oh, let's assume it exists. No. No, you don't assume, you demonstrate. Over the entire world, people have written in to tell of their amazing stories, where they really focused on having what they wanted, and got it through miracles and coincidences. Miracles and coincidences. <sighs> Shit happens. No. Actually, you either work for something to happen, and maybe it'll happen, or maybe it won't. Maybe you don't actually work for it to happen, but it happens anyway. The universe is, unfortunately, entirely indifferent. You can sometimes work for something to happen, and it will. But a lot of the time, no, it won't actually happen. I'm perfectly happy with that fact. I try to make some things happen, and, you know, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. I just live with it. I try not to let it affect me that much. But, 
you, on the other hand, are trying to say that, oh, just think positively and it will happen. No, it doesn't work that way. <sighs> this is but a small piece in the vast ocean of the internal world that I'll be talking about. It is, however, very real, and you can literally change everything in your life by willing it so. I know this from personal experience, and it's not hard to find others who have too. Argument from personal experience. Really? We're gonna go there? Okay, I know I brought up personal experience with the bully thing, but that's why I also put up the call for, you know, people who are actually more familiar with psychology to actually comment on that. If I'm wrong, let me know. You, on the other hand, I know this from personal experience. No. Science, and you have in your series title the word science, does not work that way. Personal experience means shit in science. Bad. You are a bad video. One continuous argument I hear from people who deny this law of attraction is, you don't just think things and change everything by sitting on your ass. To which I reply, exactly. You never stop moving. Just change your mindset and continue on with your life. Create your emotions in your mind, then move into them physically. Don't let your emotions control you. Pull your thoughts into the physical realm. And you just entirely missed the point of those people who are disagreeing with you. Just thinking something and even trying to work to make it happen is no guarantee it will happen. And that seems to be what you're saying. Either that or, oh, you just weren't thinking hard enough. Again, bullshit. What can you do to change things? Well, just be good to yourself. Fill yourself up with the emotion of love and happiness as you go about your day. Treat yourself and try to change your perception of your life from what others think is best for you to what you think is best for you. Now, I want to be really clear on this part. Having a positive outlook is a good thing. Wanting what's what you think is best for you is not generally a bad thing. Well, it's generally a good thing. However, you have to recognize that a lot of, that many people have been in your position before and they can see the decisions you're making and realize that, hey, this is not going to work out for the best for you. Maybe you should step back and take a look if this is actually what you want to do. So saying work for what you think is best all the time is a really, really crappy argument. I know some people are going to say that's not quite what he said, but really, am I all that far off from what he's saying? Uh, this is just the just think everything's going to be good and it's going to be good argument. No. Really, the world doesn't work that way. You can generally think, hey, I want things to be better and then go out to try to make them better as you, you see fit is better. It's not always going to work out. Take a few minutes to sit down and actually just ask yourself, what do you really want? Of course, at first a lot of people might first think of money, wealth, fame, and luxury. And hey, those things are pretty nice. But will they buy you happiness? I guess that depends on you. I found in my experiences that beyond all of those things, what people really want is to be accepted, appreciated, and loved. By giving that to others, you will in turn get that back. And the bond that connects you to everyone around you will strengthen so much further. I think the alcohol is starting to kick in at this point. Okay. Yes, everybody generally wants love, acceptance, and that, or whatever else you said. I don't care at this point. I just want this over with. Wow. Maybe you have taken a, what, 101 level psychology course, and oh look, the blatantly obvious is there for you to see. Is it just me, or is he, he contradicting himself with almost everything he says? He says one thing's true, oh, except these cases, which, you know, are really caused by everybody else. Oh, you just keep talking in circles without actually coming up with anything really insightful. I want to bring up one more thing before I run out of time. 
There was a scientist in Japan a few years back who made an incredible discovery, but one that also went largely unnoticed or recognized by the global scientific community. Dr. Masaru Emoto discovered that by putting words on a side of a glass of water and freezing the water, you could change how the water would freeze into crystals. On a jar that said, I love you, this is how the water crystal froze. On a jar that said, you make me sick, I want to kill you, it froze like this. If thoughts can do that to water, just imagine what thoughts can do to us. I have to take my glasses off for this one. Oh, that bullshit study. Seriously, look it up. If I remember to, I'll put the link in the description, but seriously, that entire study is complete and utter bullshit. There were not proper controls on it. So any conclusions it came to are complete and utter bunk. Well, looks like I'm about to out of time for today. Before I go, I want to leave you with words to sit on. For anyone who is looking for direction right now. You can have, do, or be anything you want. Namaste. Thanks for listening. Oh, that was complete bullshit. Granted. There were, you know, little tidbits in there of, you know, general knowledge, be good to others, and generally people will be good to you, but for fuck's sake. Oh, there's this spirit, or this thought realm. No! You can't just assume something into existence. It doesn't work that way. You're assigning some kind of supernatural cause to stuff that's actually really understood by psychologists and science in general. Oh, I'm gonna chug the rest of this and then sign off. Peace. Stay shiny.